Okay, so we're going to talk here about some of the surgical problems of the biliary tract uh, minus uh, things that involve stones. So this is more chronic diseases, long-term diseases of the biliary tract. I talked about the more acute diseases in the acute gallbladder uh, section, which even though it was called acute gallbladder, it really uh, included most of the acute problems of the biliary tract. So this is more chronic problems of the biliary tract. We're going to talk about the inflammatory diseases, which include primary sclerosis and cholangitis as well as uh, benign biliary strictures. I'm not going to talk about acute ascending cholangitis here. That's usually because of stones, and I talk about that in the acute gallbladder section. We'll talk about uh, some of the malignancies of the biliary tract, uh, the benign tumors, which are uncommon. We'll just briefly kind of cover those. And then the congenital malformation, which primarily is going to be cholelocal cysts. And this is a problem you'll run into if you uh, are uh, providing for pediatric patients. So the anatomy of the biliary tract, as you should know, uh, we get bile both from the gallbladder, which is where we get our bile from uh, for the food that we just ate, uh, and we get bile from the liver, which is where we get our uh, sort of basal bile that uh, we constantly have in our intestine. So in the uh, liver, we start out with the interlobar ducts, which combined into the segmental ducts, ultimately which become your left hepatic duct from your left liver and your right hepatic duct from your right liver. Those come together and form the common hepatic duct. Now when the common hepatic duct receives uh, the duct from the gallbladder, which is your cystic duct, it becomes the common biliary duct. And the common biliary duct runs to the duodenum, but right before it receives uh, the uh, pancreatic duct, which does not include bile, but it includes pancreatic enzymes. So once it receives the pancreatic duct, it becomes the uh, ampulla of water. And that's just a very, very short duct. So most of the time when it's running here, it's the common biliary duct. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, the biliary tract problems. And I apologize in advance, my allergies have been terrible this week. So uh, we'll start out with the inflammatory diseases here. Okay, uh, so primary sclerosis and cholangitis is something you really, really need to be aware of because it is common. And uh, it's common because uh, one of the problems uh, that lend itself to primary sclerosis and cholangitis is also very common. So this is a disease of unclear immunologic etiology. We know it's immunogenic in origin, but we don't really know exactly what causes it. What we do know is that there is a strong association with ulcerative colitis. Now, only about 3 4% of patients with ulcerative colitis will ever develop primary sclerosis and cholangitis. However, two-thirds of patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis also have ulcerative colitis. So if you have an ulcerative colitis patient, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to develop PSC, but if you have a PSC patient, it's very likely that they have also have ulcerative colitis. So what's happening here at a more uh, histologic level is that you're getting chronic inflammation, and with that chronic inflammation, you're getting fibrin deposition. And with the fibrin deposition, it's making the uh, biliary tract less conducive for conducting bile. And so you're getting stenosis. And this uh, stenosis is really what uh, the hallmark of the disease is. When we, look at, uh, the, uh, when we look at the bile ducts on ERCP or on MRCP, we'll see that stenosis. There's a male preponderance for PSC, and that's probably just because there's a, I believe there's a slight male preponderance for ulcerative colitis as well. The usual age of onset is about 20 to 50 years of age, so not really that much older than when a patient may get diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. They may get diagnosed with both at the same time. That's not unusual. Uh, if they get diagnosed at 20 with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, it probably wasn't very long ago that they were diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Okay, presentation. So most patients with primary, a lot of patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis are asymptomatic, especially in the early stages. The symptoms may come and go. Uh, a lot of patients can have the development of primary sclerosis and cholangitis, but they don't have the symptoms yet. 
when they do have symptoms, it's usually mild right upper quadrant pain because this can lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis because all of the bile is getting, uh, getting caught up. Uh, you can get progressive jaundice, uh, and that's going to be a, an increase in total bilirubin. And what happens is that the bilirubin gets uh, into the skin, and when it's into the skin, it causes a, an acute reaction, which then causes itching. And that's pruritus, then, is the uh, next symptom. Uh, and then fatigue is another problem. This just goes for any chronic inflammatory disease, and what you're getting here is uh, anemia of chronic disease. The symptoms can remit and relapse, and so this isn't necessarily a constant thing. However, in the end stages, it gets worse. So this is a progressive disease, but in the very beginning, it might be really mild. Occasionally, a patient can present with an acute cholangitis, and that goes for anything that blocks up, somehow blocks up the biliary tract, you can get an infection. And so in that case, you're, we're not concerned about the primary sclerosing cholangitis, we're concerned about acute cholangitis, and these patients are gonna need antibiotics and IV fluids and admission. And so those patients were treating for acute ascending cholangitis. The primary sclerosing cholangitis would be a diagnosis we'll make later on. This is a chronic disease, but if a patient has acute cholangitis, we need to treat those patients for that first. Uh, we need to treat them by stabilizing them, putting them on antibiotics. If you get a patient who has acute cholangitis, uh, the picture of acute ascending cholangitis, so fever, right upper quadrant pain, uh, jaundice, fatigue, uh, maybe hypotension, altered mental status, uh, and you've, they've never been diagnosed with PSC before, and they have a history of ulcerative colitis, PSC should be the thing that you're thinking is ultimately behind what's causing the acute uh, cholangitis episode. So be suspicious for PFC if a patient uh, presents with acute cholangitis, but they also have a history of ulcerative colitis. I, what I wanted to just uh, highlight here, though, is that patients who present with acute cholangitis, even though they're suspicious for PFC, like they have a history of ulcerative colitis, you need to first treat them for the acute cholangitis because that can kill you. The most accurate test is going to be imaging of the biliary tract by ERCP, and uh, MRCP can also be done as well as transpatic cholangiogram. Uh, you'll never, I don't think you'll ever be expected to choose between uh, two or three of these. So ERCP is the gold standard. And the reason is because you can, it, it also you get biopsies from that. So, um, I think that's all I want. Okay, so the initial test though that you will probably do in any patient with right upper quadrant pain and jaundice and fatigue and all that stuff, that would probably be a, uh, a right upper quadrant ultrasound. But that's not gonna help you very much, especially if you have a patient with a history of ulcerative colitis, they're definitely going to be getting ERCP uh, if they have any kind of symptoms that are uh, associated with biliary tract problems. Okay, so here is an ERCP. Uh, this is a normal biliary tract, okay? So here is the endoscope, and it's coming down into the stomach and then into the duodenum, just like you were doing uh, an EGD. And then it finds the papilla uh, that is where your, uh, your ampulla of water rises into your duodenum. And you can actually kind of see it here. This little, uh, this little uh, divot here in the... Uh, in the mucosa is actually where your uh, where your opening is, and what the uh, what, what the ERCP endoscope has is a little tool that comes off, and it can also shoot contrast into the uh, in, into the, um, the the biliary tract. All right, so this is your duodenum here, and then this is your ampulla of water. Now note, here's your pancreatic duct. And here is your uh, common biliary duct. Okay. Here's your cystic duct, because obviously this is your gallbladder here. And then here's your right and left hepatic duct, which comes off of your uh, common hepatic duct. So here's another one. A little bit further up close here. Uh, so you don't really see the, the pancreatic duct is right here, um, but it's a little bit harder to see that. 
so here we've got uh, the common biliary duct. This person probably had a cholecystectomy. Here you can see some staples here. So this is probably stapling the uh, cystic artery. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. And so this is probably cholecystectomy here. And then you've got your hepatic ducts there. All right, so primary sclerosing cholangitis is, it looks a little different. So note here we've got nice smooth ducts. Here we've got uh, areas of stenosis, and then the areas before you have stenosis, you're going to have dilation because you've got increased pressure there. Uh, so this is kind of zoomed in a little bit. But here's your common bile duct. Here's your pancreatic duct. This is uh, just a stump from your cystic duct, which, again, you probably have here a uh, cholecystectomy. Here's the common hepatic duct, and then the right and left hepatic ducts. Um, and you can see here you've got areas of dilation and of stenosis. So here's your stenosis with the yellow arrows and your dilation with the orange arrows. Okay, here's another one. So here you, again you can see, this is more zoomed in, this is another patient. Uh, it's, stenotic in some areas, that's where you got the disease, and then the dilation is where you've got, uh, 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 it's not diseased, but you've got uh, increased pressure. All right, so the only cure for primary sclerosis and cholangitis would be a hepatic transplantation, and uh, even that is uh, still going to be followed often by uh, biliary tract problems. So it's, these patients are very difficult to treat. Surgical therapy is usually focused on large obstruction, so if they have uh, major obstructions of their common biliary duct or even common hepatic duct, a lot of times you can place stents there, but for the most part, uh, this is very difficult to treat even surgically because this is affecting smaller ducts. A liver biopsy may be warranted uh, to stage the primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, as well as to inspect for any hepatic complications. Anytime you get, you get bile that's getting backed up in the biliary ducts, what we're thinking about possibly is secondary biliary cirrhosis. Yes, you can get cirrhosis from biliary tract problems. Uh, so a liver biopsy may be warranted in the initial diagnosis stage, uh, just to stage where they're at exactly and see if there's any hepatic complications. Some of the things that can come from primary sclerosis and cholangitis, uh, one, you have a 10% lifetime risk of cholangiocarcinoma, which is a really nasty cancer that almost always kills the person who gets it. There, it, In addition to these patients usually having ulcerative colitis, if the patient also has primary sclerosis and cholangitis in addition to their ulcerative colitis, Having the PSC is an independent risk factor for colon cancer. So patients with ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis are even more likely to get colon cancer than just your regular patient with ulcerative colitis. So this is an independent risk factor for colon cancer. Secondary biliary cirrhosis, as I mentioned, with anything that uh, causes backup in the biliary tract. And then increased risk of calcium bilirubinate stones. If you uh, watched my uh, lecture uh, that talked about stones, uh, calcium bilirubinate stones are stones that uh, form in areas where there's chronic inflammation. So even worse, these patients get uh, stenosis of their biliary ducts. They also can get stones, increased risk of stones that form. And so that can make things even more complicated. All right, so benign biliary stricture is a stricture of the biliary tract, and usually this is iatrogenic. So this is usually due to some kind of thing that we did to the patient, and they got a really elaborate uh, inflammation, uh, inflammatory response from that procedure, and now they have a stricture. Uh, most patients, you can do ERCP in or instrumentation, any kind of instrumentation, uh, and it's not going to cause a stricture. But some patients, uh, just like some patients form keloids, and uh, you know some patients can form strictures in their biliary tract secondary to instrumentation. So uh, most of the time it's iatrogenic. However, it can also be due to blunt force trauma or uh, repeated bouts of pancreatitis. The presentation is going to be really similar to uh, any kind of blockage 
uh, that can happen because this is what you're getting is a blockage. So mild colicky right upper quadrant pain, uh, usually uh, with jaundice because this is in the distal uh, biliary tract. Uh, and you can also get acute ascending cholangitis, just like you can with any blockage. You can get an infection, and so that may be how the patient presents, too. The best initial diagnostic step, because the patient has right upper quadrant pain, uh, with or without jaundice, uh, and they've got, uh, they may have fever, they may have, uh, de just depending on how the presentation is there, if it's just plain old right upper quadrant pain jaundice or acute ascending cholangitis, the best initial diagnostic step uh, for diagnosis is going to be a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Okay, so that's step one, uh, provided that the patient is stable. What you note uh, is uh, not quite as important as what you don't note. So what you don't note is, uh, is stones. Stones will not be present usually in a patient with benign biliary stricture. Why? Because it's not, the stones aren't causing the problem. I should say stones will not be noted in the distal bile ducts. You may note stones in the, uh, in the, uh, in the gallbladder, uh, but they won't have stones in the distal uh, biliary tract because it's not a stone that's causing the problem. They don't have cholecholithiasis. These patients have basically simulated cholecholithiasis because they have a stricture of their distal biliary tract. What you will note, however, is portions of the bile duct that are uh, dilated, and it should be the proximal part to the stricture. So everything before the stricture uh, will be somewhat dilated, and then you'll have your stricture, and then what's after the stricture should be normal in appearance. And again, it's just like kind of like cholecholithiasis, where you have a blockage. The only difference is that this is from a stricture, not from a stone. Best diagnostic test when you suspect biliary stricture, and you should suspect biliary stricture in a patient who doesn't have stones but has proximal dilation, especially in a patient who has had a history of any kind of biliary tract procedure, uh, you should go forth with an ERCP. And you might think, well, why are we going after ERCP since isn't that what gave them the biliary stricture? Well, yes, but an ERCP will help you place a stent, and a stent is the treatment. So here is a benign biliary stricture, and you see here that we've got uh, our instrument, and uh, this is going just going slightly into the uh, ampulla vater and uh, squirting out the fluid here, and you can kind of see the pancreatic duct right here, and then here you have uh, your stricture, and uh, you can see maybe some this might be some uh, dilatation here of the. Uh, of the, of the proximal portions. So here's your stricture. Here's another one. So here's the, uh, the stricture here and then your uh, dilations. Okay, and then this is another patient. Uh, what you don't see here is uh, a uh, gallbladder. So this is your pancreatic duct here. Cystic duct would be right here, um, and then uh, looks like this is your this is your division of your uh, left and right. I don't know. I can't tell because this is such a small picture. I think this here is your division between your left and right uh, uh, hepatic ducts. Okay. So uh, malignancies. Uh, this is another thing that can cause a uh, that that can cause. Uh, problems in your uh, biliary tract. Uh, it can also cause jaundice and that's due to of course obstruction just like these other two things. So these also cause obstructive jaundice. Carcinoma of the gallbladder is relatively uncommon when we're thinking about cancers overall but when we're talking about cancers of the biliary tract meaning the biliary ducts plus the gallbladder this is the most common of the biliary tract. So 90% of patients will have had cholelithiasis um, or active cholelithiasis, meaning cholecystitis. Uh, a lot of times they have a long-standing history of biliary tract problems. Typically, carcinoma of the gallbladder is found after an acute event where you do a cholecystectomy. And a lot of times what you're supposed to do is when the surgeon takes the gallbladder out, they're supposed to take a biopsy of the gallbladder just in case, uh, so that it can be sent off to pathology and 99% of the time it comes back normal, but the 1% of the time when it doesn't, 
then we know in advance before this patient starts developing major symptoms of cancer, uh, we can treat them uh, earlier and that improves their survival. So most of the time when this is discovered, it's when the gallbladder is taken out for other reasons, the surgeon does a biopsy and lo and behold, this time it comes back with cancer. How does this present? Well, normally it presents uh, just due to the fact that the patient usually has chronic biliary problems. They've got stones. So it's usually going to present with right upper quadrant pain, uh, fever, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, may present with jaundice, uh, altered mental status, etc. if you've got a uh, cholidocal stone. Uh, but in general, this is going to present just like your typical uh, cholelithiasis patient who has symptoms because that's usually how it's discovered. If the patient, however, uh, has advanced cancer, then, of course, like any other cancer patient, they're going to develop uh, symptoms of cancer uh, such as anorexia, weakness, and weight loss. Uh, so... This is one thing I really want you to remember from this, because I think this is how the USMLE would like to present this one to you. On abdominal x-ray, remember, we always get an abdominal x-ray in a patient where we suspect uh, cholecystitis. On abdominal x-ray, 50% of patients who have carcinoma of the gallbladder will have this classic porcelain gallbladder. And porcelain gallbladder is just a calcified gallbladder. And this is extremely suspicious for carcinoma of the gallbladder. When it's present, I would say it pretty much is always carcinoma of the gallbladder. However, only about 50% of patients who have carcinoma of the gallbladder have the porcelain gallbladder. But either way, if the patient has this porcelain gallbladder, they need to have their gallbladder taken out as soon as possible. Right upper quadrant ultrasound will likely show stones, but no acute cholecystitis. So they'll probably have a lot of stones in their gallbladder, but no wall thickening. Of course, unless you have a stone in the neck or in the cystic duct where you do have uh, acute cholecystitis superimposed on carcinoma of the gallbladder. Uh, so by the time it's discovered, usually it's spread. The carcinoma of the gallbladder spreads locally to the liver. It also spreads lymphatically to uh, local uh, lymph nodes and uh, the treatment here is going to be cholecystectomy as well as wedge resection of uh, the local liver and uh, regional uh, lymphadenectomy, not lymphadenopathy, lymphadenectomy. So here's a porcelain gallbladder. You should not be able to see a gallbladder usually like this on abdominal x-ray. Another one and here's another one. Okay, cholangiocarcinoma, I sort of talked about in the acute section, but it warrants talking about again because this is a big one that comes up on the USMLE. So this is a malignancy of the bile duct epithelium, and it accounts for about 5 to 30 percent of all hepatobiliary malignancies. Usually this presents in older patients. When it does present, it can present anywhere on the biliary tract, but when it shows up, most commonly, it's where the left and right hepatic ducts come together to form the common hepatic duct. Um, and a tumor that sits right there, uh, surgeons call that a Klatskin's tumor. The risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma are pretty much anything that can cause inflammation uh, of your biliary ducts. So primary sclerosis and cholangitis and ulcerative colitis cholidocal cysts, which we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as uh, infection with Clonorchis sinensis, which is a tapeworm that you get uh, from fish. The symptoms include dull and achy right upper quadrant pain. This is not an acute event, uh, so uh, this is usually something that's going to be uh, a, more of a long-term pain rather than a pain that came on six hours and 20 minutes ago. So dull and achy right upper quadrant pain, hepatomegaly, Remember where it tends to be, it tends to be uh, where the right and left hepatic ducts come together. So if it's blocking the hepatic ducts, you can get hepatomegaly. You can have a palpable abdominal mass, obstructive jaundice, because this is an obstruction after all, and obstructive jaundice causes pruritus, can also cause dark urine, clay-colored stools, because the, uh, the reason that you're getting dark urine is because the bile is going into, the bilirubin is going into the urine, and so you're going to get a dark urine, and the bilirubin is not going into the intestine, 
And so the stools are not going to be brown colored as they should be, they'll, they'll be clay colored. And then uh, you can also have signs of cancer, which would include malaise and weight loss and fatigue. Differential diagnosis here is biliary strictures, as we talked about, cholelithiasis, cysts, which we'll talk about next, cholelithiasis, cholelithiasis, and uh, also pancreatic cancer. So with diagnosis, usually you can suspect it on sonography because you see a mass, but you don't see a stone. Uh, labs will be sus suspicious for cholangiocarcinoma just in the fact that you will have a picture of obstructive jaundice, so elevated total bilirubin, but highly elevated uh, AP. And then CT will also help you. Uh, you may see a mass there. And ERCP, though, is what you need to do ultimately because that's going to help you get the biopsy. So ERCP is uh, uh, really important uh, regardless of whether you see the tumor on CT uh, or sonography because if the tumor is less than two centimeters, it can go undiagnosed with just sonography and CT. So ERCP is going to be really important uh, diagnostically anyway. You may also want to get a CEA or a CA199. Those are tumor markers. Uh, for pancreatic cancer, and CA199 is a tumor marker for cholangiocarcinoma. So that may help you too, as far as the lab workup. But the ERCP is the most important diagnostic step here. The treatment is going to be resection, and what procedure you do is going to depend on the location. Uh, however, most of these patients are not going to be cured. Palliation can be done by placing stents. Uh, that'll help with their jaundice and their pain. But in general, like I mentioned, this has a poor prognosis. So where can this happen? Well, this can happen intrahepatically, in which case we would do a segmental resection of the liver, just take the liver out, or part of the liver out that has the, the cancer. It can happen where it usually happens 80% of the time, uh, at the uh, confluence of the left and right hepatic ducts, in which case you would do a hepaticojejunostomy. Uh, and then it can happen distally, which is less common, in which case you do a Whipple procedure. So here is a suspected angiocarcinoma. What you have here is your left hepatic duct and uh, your right hepatic duct here, uh, and you've got a blockage. Okay. Don't worry about having to read those on the USMLE. I've never seen a question that's forced you to read uh, ERCPs on the USMLE. So ampullary carcinoma is a, an uncommon cancer. It arises in the ampulla of Vodder, which is like a couple centimeters before you enter the intestine. So the presentation is similar to pancreatic cancer because pancreatic cancer, uh, if it's in the head of the pancreas, uh, it's, it's right next to where an ampullary cancer would be. And so you're gonna get blockage. And so you'll have intermittent jaundice, pruritus, uh, right upper quadrant pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, just like pancreatic cancer. What you might see in ampullary cancer that you don't see though in pancreatic cancer necessarily or in cholangiocarcinoma uh, or in any of the other cancers we've talked about so far uh, is diarrhea and possibly occult blood in the stool. And the reason is because this is a cancer of a different kind of tissue. And this tissue it has a, a potential to bleed. Uh, I can't remember if it's intestinal tissue. I think it is. Um, and so this actually can bleed just like a colon cancer can bleed. And so this would cause a, uh, it doesn't bleed a lot, but this would cause a, uh, uh, an occult blood in the stool. And so this can cause uh, a blood in the stool. So that's important to remember for ampullary carcinoma. Of course, since you have jaundice and right upper quadrant pain, the best initial diagnostic step is going to be ultrasound. What you're going to note here is dilated biliary ducts, which indicates a blockage. You'll also get then at that point a CT, uh, and uh, that may show the cancer, but it might not. Uh, the most accurate test is going to be an EGD with biopsy. Why are we not doing an ERCP? because this is a cancer of the ampulla, of the ampulla of water, and the, a lot of times it will then also uh, progress out into the, uh, into the intestine. So because it shoots out into the intestine most of the time, 
all you need to do is get an EGD and you can get a biopsy of the, uh, of the uh, ampulla right there. I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Treatment is going to be surgical resection. Uh, that's done via Whipple's procedure, just like you would do for pancreatic cancer that can be uh, uh, resected. Prognosis is poor, 20 to 64% at five years, but that's a much better prognosis than pancreatic cancer, which is only about 5% after five years. So here's a, uh, the duodenal papilla, which is just the emptying of the uh, ampulla of water via the sphincter of Adi, which controls it. Uh, into the duodenum. So this is the uh, this is the outlet for the uh, the biliary tract into the duodenum, and this is how it looks normally. It's just sort of this puckering of tissue. Uh, you can kind of see the uh, what might be the lumen right here. This is obviously not normal. This is in the same place, but here you have obviously what's a, a tumor. So this is normal and not normal. Okay, so benign tumors of the biliary tract, uh, these are uncommon, very uncommon. Usually they're adenomas. The major problem, though, is to differentiate them from cholangiocarcinoma. So this is why we're getting a biopsy. They present the same way as cholangiocarcinomas. Remember, cholangiocarcinoma, the way it's presenting is blockage. You're going to have uh, a similar presentation as cholangiocarcinoma. You're going to get your biopsy, uh, and so the diagnostic protocol follows the same way. You're going to get an ultrasound, follow it by uh, ERCP, uh, and biopsy. Because this is a blockage issue, you're going to want to remove the tumor. Even though it's not cancerous, it's causing right upper quadrant pain and jaundice for the patient. You don't want that, so you'll want to remove the tumor. These are uncommon, very uncommon. Okay, finally we'll talk about cholidocal cysts. So the cholidocal cyst is more of a pediatric problem, and this is a congenital malformation of the biliary ducts, and most of the time it presents in the first year of life with jaundice and uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia, because ultimately it's going to affect the liver. And it's not as common in the U.S. as it is in, uh, in parts of Asia. The presentation is intermittent jaundice as well as a right upper quadrant mass. Remember, babies, little kids, they're small. So it's easy to feel any kind of mass that they've got going on. There is a classification for cholidocal cysts. Whether you need to memorize this, I would say you don't. But what, there is something that you do need to know about uh, this classification system. So the type 1 cholidocal cysts is a fusiform dilation, so kind of like a, 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 like a abdominal aortic aneurysm, kind of looks like that. This would be a type 1 cholidocal cyst. And the, these are all in the common bile duct. Uh, so type 2 would be a diverticulum of the common bile duct, right here. Type 3 would be a dilation uh, at the uh, ampulla of Vater, so distal to the pancreatic duct. Type 4 and type 5 are uh, the ones that may possibly require uh, a liver transplantation, and that's because they affect the intrahepatic ducts. So that's inside the liver, so it's difficult to, it's difficult to treat that without, uh, without manipulating the liver. So it's really going to depend. Uh, all of the type 5 will uh, require a liver transplantation, and most of the type 4 will require it. Uh, so type 4 is dilation of the intrahepatic ducts and extrahepatic ducts, seen here. Type 5 is dilation of the intrahepatic ducts only, and that's also known as Caroli's disease. So here's a type 1. You can see here this is just a fusiform dilation of the common bile duct. Here's your pancreatic duct coming in here. Here's your, uh, it's hard to tell. I don't know if this patient has had a uh, cholecystectomy or not, so I'm not going to make any assumptions on the anatomy. So here is a, uh, oh, this is, I guess this is the gallbladder right here. So this is a huge, this is a huge uh, defect. Okay, so here is a uh, common bile duct. Uh, this is a type 3. So here uh, you've got uh, the cyst right here, uh, right next to the pancreatic duct. And I'm not sure what the view is here. Okay, and then here's a type 4 
So what you see here is a dilation of the, uh, the common bile duct, and then you also have uh, dilations in the hepatic ducts. And here's type 5. You don't see anything wrong with the uh, distal ducts, the extra hepatic ducts, but you do see dilations of the right hepatic ducts and a couple of the left. 